to the People by People podcast with me, your host, Laura Sutherland. Today, I'm with the next James Bond. <laughs> Only kidding, that's how we would like to be addressed, I think. But I'm with Mark Webb, who is at that multiple stage in his career. Um, he's head of comms at Shift.ms, a public speaker and a campaigner. And I'm really delighted to welcome Mark to the People by People podcast today. Welcome! Thank you, Laura. Um, it, it, it's funny. It, it, it's not the first time I've mentioned the silly um, James Bondness of my uh, potential, but I am something of a disability slash diversity campaigner. And personally, I would love to be Idris to see Idris Elba as the next James Bond. But I jokingly make the reference to myself as the next James Bond, just because. Um, why can't we consider disability? I know I'm not going to be jumping off trains and blowing up baddies, but it was kind of a silly point to make a serious point. Yeah, absolutely. And a point well made as well. Um, so just for people that um, are listening that maybe don't know you, haven't kind of met you, I met you at the um, through the PRC's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council, which I sat on for a year or so. I've, I've recently stepped back. Um, but just can you give maybe give people a sort of plotted history about how you got into public relations in the first place? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think nowadays, and, and I'm sure, I know, Laura, you and I are both 29 years old, um, but uh, for our, our younger listeners, um, PR is something of a career, isn't it? And you can get qualifications and be all very grown up about it. But I'm actually old enough to have stumbled into it um, like uh, many people of my generation um, so that um, you know I used to joke that um, if you didn't know what you were going to do you went into either HR or PR uh, and I think that's uh, where I was so I had um, been a high flyer at school flouncy head boy captain of rugby um, upshot of which was I didn't know what I was going to do because everything was landing on my plate so I ended up as a ski bum then a ski rep and uh, this was in the early 90s and a theme park east of Paris opened run by a four foot mouse called Mickey and um, I suddenly found myself jumping on an ad um, to work for the opening of Euro Disney um, and because I'd been a holiday rep um, I ended up essentially a posh rep for celebrities so uh, 1992, when you open a new Disney theme park in a new continent, uh, you tend to get serious A-list celebrities. So I ended up looking after Michael Jackson and Clint Eastwood and Kevin Costner and um, George Bush Sr. and President Mitterrand and Gloria Estefan, my favorite. And all that was lovely. Um, it really was. Um, but um, Actually, I, I was then exposed to, to camera crews and journalists and radio interviews, always behind the scenes, but just falling in love with it. So I, I literally did fall into PR just because it was a natural progression to hanging around with celebs drinking champagne. Can we just go back to Michael Jackson? <laughs> I mean, come on. There's a guy who just falls into working in Euro Disney and then gets to meet all these amazing people. And that takes like some people actually try like for their whole entire careers to get to that sort of level when you just stumble into it. Maybe that's symbolic, however, of so many people that work in our industry that they just have these opportunities when um, you know, the, the kind of um, the background that we have, um, the, the education that we've had uh, and, you know, kind of going to Euro, uh, Euro Disney. I remember um, one of I studied hospitality before I got into public relations and I remember going to Euro Disney on one of our trips and we were there to inverted commas for those who can't see. Uh, go and study the hospitality <laughs> whereas really what we just did was had a bit of fun went on the rides um, and it was just hilarious it was so much fun but the, the behind the scenes thing is what you the real sort of sense um, I don't know if you've seen um, one of the or oh, what was the film the film um, with I was going to say Denzel Washington it wasn't Eddie Murphy and he went to Wally's World Yes, Wonder um, World, it, Wally's World, or something. 
it was it was oh gosh it was his series it was about his third film it was the yes. least, least good one but it was still fun because <laughs> it was hilarious of, though <laughs> yes Bev, Bev, Beverly Hills Beverly Hills crap by the time uh, Beverly Hills Court, yes. yes that's it love it love it yeah that reminds me of um yeah you're just <laughs> Yes, behind behind the scenes was ab, was in a sense more fascinating. You know, it was always bloody marvelous for me to pop in at lunchtime, literally, because I fancied going on a roller coaster. So that that was an amazing thing. But behind the scenes, I can remember um, my best friend at the time. You know, he, he came out to visit very often, and, and I did take him backstage very quickly. And he was just more blown away that than any um, 360 degrees um, loop the loop. It, it's amazing behind the scenes, much more than, you know, the, the magic on, on scene. Um, but if you For want sure. to talk about, if you want to talk about Michael Jackson briefly, um, <laughs> ni- 90s, um, that was, of course, pre-scandal. Um, so um, it, at the time, the only scandal was about his plastic surgery. Um, so uh, the three questions I were asked were about plastic surgery. Oh, my word. Yes, bloody hell. Um, loads of it uh, amazingly badly done. Um, two was Bubbles the chimpanzee with him. No. Three, did he sleep in an oxygen tent? No. So that, that's about as far as the gossip went at the time. But it was a mad uh, three days with him, seven cars, Renault Espaces, you know, the sort of minivans full of him and his entourage and me in the front car with him. Bonkers, bonkers, bonkers. And if I just finish on one anecdote, how many people in the world have had It's a Small World sung to him by Michael Jackson in the back of his car? Well, I have. <laughs> Love it. And here we have a celebrity joining us today. Never mind James Bond. <laughs> We have Mark Webb. <laughs> he had a private concert with Michael Jackson in the back of a Renault Spaz. Lucky <laughs> <love> me. <laughs> lucky, lucky me. <laughs> On to more serious things, though. <laughs> You're positioned as an ambassador for disability in PR, um, and it's based on your own experience. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and how the industry handles practitioners with disabilities right now? Yeah, so um, let's step back very quickly as a a real quick trot through career because it's kind of relevant. When I look back, that same Michael Jackson year, 1992, were my first symptoms. Pins and needles, uh, intense for about three days down my left-hand side and uh, bladder issues, but I lived in France. So um, trees and gateposts were thoroughly visible at the time to we um, when you couldn't get to the loo. Um, That was a very French thing in the 90s. Um, But I I cast them aside. I was in my 20s, carefree. Uh, Step forward um, to David Lloyd Leisure, where I was head of comms. And every year I was doing a triathlon and every year stumbling on my left foot, which turns out to have been a symptom called foot drop, which is, sorry, uh, we haven't actually introduced my condition. It's called multiple sclerosis. Uh, So it's a progressive condition of the the central nervous system which can affect random bits of your body cause your central nervous system heads everywhere so so bladder uh, pins and needles stumbling and uh, still wasn't putting things together Um, and then I trotted up at uh, Dixon's retail now Dixon's car phone in 2006 ish maybe 2005 and uh, I was uh, a head of uh, corporate PR I was trying to be grown up Um, moving on from the consumer PR and say serious things, um, you know, robust performance and words like that. Um, And um, around two years later, everything was going a little bit haywire with my body. And finally, with my wife, we uh, realized something was up and uh, went to see the um, uh, GP who sent me to a urologist that's a waterworks person and a neurologist that's the brain person and together after about a three-month process which is actually quite speedy in a very complex disease for diagnosis um, it was concluded I had multiple sclerosis Um, and um, if I can talk about three touch points where Dixon's were bloody amazing Um, so on diagnosis I went home to feel sorry for myself, grieve, bash the wall, whatever else you do when you're given a horrible diagnosis. 
And by the time I got back, maybe two weeks later, the team around me had um, done some research off their own backs to find out what I was going through, both in terms of physically uh, what MS meant, but also the kind of thought processes and grieving processes I've been going be going through so that they just treated me so empathetically and sympathetically and knew to talk to me. And that just set me up to keep going. I, I was healthy ish to carry on um, with my job at the time. And they were just a, a great supportive team. Um, that's it's very difficult to to uh, teach a specific lesson from that, except, except to be nice, normal, human, and actually talk to the person, whether they're bereaved or diagnosed with something horrible or PTSD about something or whatever. It's so easy. You know, I get there's a certain number of people who are terrified of or repulsed by disability or someone who's experiencing loss or whatever. Um, but there's an awful lot more people who are just scared to tackle the subject and it's so often we would just like to be asked and we might say, no, no, fine. Thank, thanks for asking. That's brilliant. I, I appreciate that you appreciate it. Or you might say, oh, you might just bluster out with loads of stuff you want to talk about. But to be talked to as a human, still a human being, I haven't changed overnight is wonderful. Touch point one. Touch point two, a couple of years later, um, I had moved from appearing normal to walking drunk so to speak to walking with a walking stick to walking with a rollator you know a zimmer frame to eventually coming in in a wheelchair and um allied to the sort of the actual physical disabilities i uh, was experiencing chronic fatigue chronic means forever um, and it implies bad and it was so I wasn't particularly coping well I was just about holding it together but I wasn't really able to get into the office um, as much and I certainly wasn't able to get into London where I should have been having the odd drink and dinner with journalists um, you know getting to know the journalists and parallel to that social media was exploding and I was finding myself talking on social media to the same journalists that I knew personally uh, and weirdly talking to them in a sense more regularly than the monthly call or the quarterly results call or whatever. I was every day, you know, feeding back to Dixon's, hey, do you, do you realize Neil at the mail on Sunday is talking about X subject? Have we got anything else we could approach him to? So it was giving us a new angle. And at the same time, um, Dixon's, the senior team, could see me um, suffering and struggling. And I was called into a room. And I have to say, I, I kind of feared that moment. I thought it was the guilty check moment. The, um, you know, there, there, Mark, off you go into the sunset, have a few grand, uh, you've been great. And actually, it was quite the opposite. It was, I, I'll paraphrase it because I can't remember it exactly, particularly because I, I went home in tears of, of good emotion. But it was essentially, look, Mark, you're not coping. We want to help you what can we do to create a role that will help you and help us? Um, and so we developed a role that was win-win for the business. At the time, our CEO, Seb, uh, Sebastian James, who's now the CEO of Boots, was very active on Twitter. And um, I was active on Twitter and, and other social media. And um, together with his feed, my feed, and the corporate, the Dixon's retail, then Dixon's car phone feed, we turned him into the most followed uh, CEO on the FTSE 100 using his authentic voice, but my nag. Um, I had a very strong voice with retail and business journalists and Dixon's car phones feed was one that was referred to in results days. So it gave us a new channel and me a new lease of life in business, um, particularly because on a bad day when I couldn't make it into the office, I could be tweeting from bed. So that's uh, touch point number two. That's um, amazing, though, that, that such a, such an, an honest and human approach was taken. Because I think one of the things we briefly touched on before was the fear of 
not saying the right thing or asking the right question or not knowing how to ask the question because you're maybe you don't want to offend somebody or make them more upset and the fact that you know they went away and did their research and talked to you and, and said we're here and we're you know we're going through this with you you know and then how can we make a role for you that helps both you and us it's just it's it's amazing to have a case study like that to be able to showcase like and that was back then that's not even you know yesterday where you know you'd think that some of these companies would now start to think to do that that was back then and it just shows you the kind of leadership um, and the relationship you must have had with them that they appreciated you that much as well yeah yeah i uh, yes look um let let's hope that I, it was partly because i was doing a good job but essentially it was because they were good people yeah um you know and and i um uh, i was in a senior role so i i got various share options um i i have no shares or any interest any physical interest in the company anymore and yet four or five years since i le left them I'm still the ultimate employee advocate. And, and that's, it's a weird and wonderful thing um, because just to finish the Dixon story and my third touch point, uh, you know, I, I, when I left, I, I went to them and said, look, I, you know, you, you've been brilliant, but I, I, I do need to move on. I, I'm going to let you down at some point because I really was suffering and couldn't. I was a, on a four day week, by the way, by then. Um, uh, and again i was on i can't remember three months notice six month notice whatever they they helped me out with more so the departure was amicable amicable and positive there's this word called reasonable adjustment that is what you're legally required to do for disabled people um and that is what you the cliche is the the lift or the ramp for the the wheelchair uh, being a little bit more um, creative, you know, maybe your big screen for somebody who's visually impaired or a quiet area for somebody who's neurodiverse or struggle has um, hearing difficulties. Um, but, you know, reasonable adjustment is one thing. That's your legal requirement. This empathetic adjustment, that's what I just I, I, I remain blown away by. You know, most of the people I reported to talk to um have moved on but i'm this, this this fanboy for dixon's um unpaid i think they owe me a piece of slice of cake now but um, <laughs> at the very least <laughs> I, I i i think so but but that that that's the magic of real employee advocacy is a buzzword now isn't it and um there, there's a certain um la fairly large um, deliverer of goods who's been at saviors to us all in the pandemic um, begins with a could be Alibaba but might be something cl closer to America um, and um, the rumor was that they paid some of their warehouse workers to say nice things about how great it was to work in warehouses now that's one version of employee advocacy but it's one that I totally disagree with the version of actually being good guys so that um that employees actually genuinely authentically talk up your business that's what i call employee advocacy and it's so powerful and talk i i, I touched briefly on um uh, the younger age group who might be listening into your podcast um but i i get to think i am <laughs> i well I, I know i know you're i know you're half my age but, but... <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> I might um, look it. <laughs> you, you, oh yeah, <laughs> you certainly do. Um, <laughs> but but um, you know, I get the sense that five, ten years ago, the the younger generation, if we were talking about ethics, it was all about um, is a company I want to work for green slash now now the word sustainable. I think coming in now is the is the whole ethics around a company. Are they diverse? Do they do the right? Uh, business practice as, as regards the world uh, and so it, it it's not just to be a nice company with a small n it, it's to be it's to do the right thing and I think an employee a future employee is starting to research that before before considering going for a job yeah especially as you say that the younger generation that's, that's coming through they're much more conscious of values um, of ethics 
how um, money is invested into back into the business and into the, the stakeholders essentially. Um, and I find that, um, you know, I still kind of coming back to how great Dixon's were to you and um, what a good relationship you must have had. And it must, and you know, it's a two way, a two way thing, um, relationship like that, isn't it? Um, and that, you know, one of the questions I had to you was about what about past employers and, and how they've, um, you know, worked with you on that. And that just answers that. But what do you think about our industry? Because, you know, you've been, you know, talking at a number of events, you've been, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in our industry. What would you say the, what would you say the state of um, our industry is in terms of disability right now? Because from my perspective as, a practitioner, but also as somebody who's, you know, been in, in senior roles within, um, you know, PRC and CIPR, um, I can't say that I, inverted commas, saw a lot of disability. And um, I think one of the things we chatted about earlier on was how can we approach disability to ensure that there is disability, whether it's visible or not, um, you know, do we need like a register or, you know, what, what if people don't want to, you know, be kind of um, public with their disability? How can how can we go about this? Because it is sensitive, but if we don't talk about it, then people won't know how to how to go about it. Ah, the million, the million euro question. <laughs> um, it, 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 I think it's a very, I, your, your first question is how how are we with it? And with the disabled community. I think our relationship as an industry is disabled. Uh, I think we're, we're pretty rubbish at it. Um, now, uh, but that's not entirely the fault of uh, the PR industry. Um, I think it is the, the nature of the PR industry. And we are still seen as hardworking, all hours, always available, always at it, full on, uh, into London, hopping on trains, hopping on the telly, whatever. It, it's a huge high pressure industry. It might not be as true as it used to be, but it certainly still is. And I, I think one of the issues there is the stigma around disability. So if you disclose you're disabled, now I do suffer from chronic fatigue and um, I can be tweeting from bed I can fall asleep um, just prior to a meeting and just prior after a meeting. And so there is a stigma around disability, which is sometimes it's true about, for example, fatigue and accessibility, et cetera. But um, there comes to that the, the fact that we don't always want to disclose yeah. our disabilities um, because we'll be seen as weak. We automatically are. That's, um, that's sometimes a, uh, a very judgmental human nature thing sometimes subconscious but we don't want to be seen as weak in a pr industry that's supposed to be sort of you know well let's be very um undiverse is supposed to be very pushy and alpha male yeah, yeah. um so um i think before we could suddenly i mean there are lists out there um uh, of uh, speakers of protagonists uh, whatever and there's a speaker circuit and I find myself on the same panels with the same people very often because there's a sort of a limited pool that are, yeah. are, are out there um, but but I think um, it will be very helpful in the first instance to destigmatize it and that's why I'm busy shouting about it from my wheelchair with my you know my blog is called one man and his catheters.com and that's partly because i think as my own defense mechanism um i i use um bad jokes and humor to to allow myself to talk about the icky stuff but it's also to just destigmatize it so so i think before we can decide that x percent of your employees must be disabled i'm not sure we'll ever get there but I think the destigmatization is the first step. And we as communicators, because that's our job in it, we could just help in that first instance, just to help push that and, and help um, promote disability to within the whole diversity discussion. You know, I came to diversity through my disability. I've got a very high powered, beautiful um, senior wife 
and I've seen her crash into the odd glass ceiling, smash through a couple. So, you know, I, I see her from her side, that angle. And on all the diversity panels I've sat, you know, I see um, uh, LGBT issues. I see ethnic, with MS, I can't pronounce things. My, my tongue gets tied. So I bloody have to say, ethnicity and really concentrate to say ethnicity and even worse intersectionality intersectionality for those who don't know is is talking about when when in diversity you cross multiple uh issues so to speak it's not an issue but for example if you are a gay a british asian that that's intersectionality if you are a um a, a female disabled uh black girl in the paralympics that that kind of that that's intersectionality there you go i've said it twice in a row correctly um but but you know i on these panels always considered first and they all deserve to be there but always is gender ethnicity and sexuality those are kind of the first three absolutely deserve to be up there um, but so does um, uh, disability. Yeah. And by the way, because I am admit I am admitting to being over thirty now, um, age should be there too. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, age is something that uh, we touched on at PR Fest um, last month. Um, there, there have been a number of things that have been started, but haven't necessarily come to anything with age. I think it was um, PR, was it PR Academy or PR Moment? One of them was doing um, the top 50 under 50. Um, I know Daryl Sperry had done something um, to sort of shine a light on the over 50s um, or maybe it was the over 60s. But it's, it's, about, um, it's about then the action that comes from that. And I think that's like we're all so good at talking in our industry, but it's then about, okay, that's great, but what we're going to do, like how, how can we improve? And like, that's one reason why, um, you know, somebody like you who's actually happy to talk about, um, you know, your problems, um, the opportunities, how you overcome them, um, but also actions you think that people can take. Just simply even things like going and educating yourself and listening Although they're like the two probably most basic things you could ever think of, actually they're probably not things that people would think of naturally to go and do to solve a problem that they might have about, um, you know, kind of feeling uncomfortable about um, someone with a disability. Um, and that's, that's part of, I suppose, like the human makeup, because for how many generations have we swept things under the carpet or, you know, whispered behind, you know, your hand, like, you know, if somebody has cancer, it was, it was known as the big C. Um, and, you know, you never really talked about things like that. Um, and people sometimes didn't even go and get diagnosed, you know, years ago because they didn't like going in and admitting they were ill in some way, shape or form. And, and that's how society has changed. Um, but I don't really feel necessarily that, the, that many organisations have changed their um their approach to being more open like society is about these things and unless organizations it was less unless human beings change in the first place they're the people that run the organizations and, and make it like that so i think you know as you see we have a job to go and do and um kind of uh, go away educate ourselves but also to try and get rid of the stigma um and that is probably the first port of call for any practitioner, but also anyone that's going in and, or, and advising organizations as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are now being paid to go in and, and advise on diversity and inclusion. But if that doesn't include things like disability and getting rid of the stigma around it, and that being part of a strategy, then they're not really being diverse and inclusive. And it kind of comes back to, you know, the terminology of greenwashing, like, you know, just seeing something to tick that box, whereas they actually have to come back and mean it and show it and act and say and do. And I think those are the key things that will give indicators that the, 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 the sort of dial is moving essentially, which is what we need. 
Yes, um, I, I'm glad you brought out the word tick box um, because um, there, there, there's an awful lot of that, frankly. Um, going back to, you know, I mentioned the green movement, say, 10 years ago, and everybody was installing a, a one, uh, you know, uh, windmill on their roof and saying they were green um, and, and um, similar is happening in the, in the whole diversity thing and I'm not just talking about disability everybody knows that DNI is a must now but some people aren't doing it properly a lot of people aren't doing it properly they're doing it because they feel they have to it's a bit like that reasonable adjustment that you have to legally for disability yeah. i think dni is it can be a tick box so my to-do list for an organization would be one to have a very senior sponsor on it your ceo or a board member mm -hmm. who re really cares about it who is, who is accountable for it so it's not just appointing a, a junior dni person to attend meetings and say hold on um have you thought about the ramp you know nonsense like that i think yeah. somebody very senior to be engaged with dni reporting on dni having dni report to them so that's one and two i'm not i haven't been very scientific about it and studied it but i'm person particularly with small organizations it's very difficult to have somebody from every diverse diverse um flavor just in their organization um so i don't particularly um subscribe to targets but what i do subscribe to is um transparency so if you start keeping and and confirming in your annual reports in a small little every so often update you know this year we, we're really pleased because we've recruited three more x and uh you know four more so and so's have had uh, training in y so i i i think again i'm not the hr guru but i prefer transparency over concrete targets and, yeah. and i think a senior sponsor real action and transparency those would be the the the, the things that i would ask organizations to do human beings well there's going to be tosses out there forever um, but um, there's um, there's an awful lot of people who are probably just scared, worried about the issue, worried about saying the wrong thing, not yeah. just about disability. But I understand that's a particularly difficult topic. Um, so I, it, to, to the human beings out there, tosses, you can stay sodding off because you'll stay sodding off anyway. Um, but yeah. the, the average normal human being who just wants to do the right thing as a person and for their business it is often to broach the subject, is to have the courage to actually make the mistake. And PR people, we, we, we're known to be pedantic, are we not? And be scared of saying the wrong thing. And sometimes we miss out on saying the right thing by doing that. It is to approach the subject. And I think most disabled people, certainly me, would understand if somebody says the wrong thing while saying trying to say the right thing if yeah. you know what I mean just having the conversation then you correct them you know that they've meant well and you move on that's yeah. that that's how the world should be uh, I'm afraid it's over a hundred years since the suffragette ran in front of a horse and we're still nowhere near getting equality in gender mm. so I know it's way beyond my lifetime that any kind of equality will be achieved in disability but we have to keep pushing yeah I, I mean, I, we briefly touched on um, PR face last year and, and my sort of journey with diversity and inclusion. And it actually just reminded me that probably just now is a good time to remind everybody that has downloaded the Driven Pledge. Um, Mark, I don't know if you've seen the Driven Pledge, very long and short of it, a framework was developed um, by Rax Lacani, who used to be the chair um, at PRC. And... Um, Rax and Cool Deep Mamie from um, Taylor Bennett Foundation came and spoke about um, basically diversity and inclusion, their experiences, but also um, this framework that was developed um, and it was D-R-I-V-E-N and um, you can have a look at it on the PR Face website, I won't talk too much about it, but interestingly out of the framework that was put together to, to have the conversation, we then crowdsourced, um, there was maybe about 60 people at, at PR Fest on that day. 
and we crowdsourced solutions to some of those challenges and put like a um, like a grid together of like basically a download that you can download the driven pledge and you can take it back to your agency or your organization and you can start a discussion around those challenges but also some of the actions you can take to to overcome the challenges and to really prompt discussions the right parts of the discussion um it was it was downloaded maybe about 200 times and um, which is great because if that's helped 200 people or 200 agencies or 200 organizations then it's better than nobody at all um it came under a little bit of criticism from some people um i'm which I have to say I was surprised at because we talk about, you know, always being a talking shop and actually not having any action. And the whole point of that was to demonstrate that there could be action, that people, no matter what level you're at, can take action. And it was to encourage people to go away after that session and take action. Um, and the next month marks a year since that was launched and it marks a year since we said that we want people to report back on what they have done as a result of it and that includes me so I'll be you know kind of going back to that and I'll be accountable by um, by sharing what I've done to become better to become more diverse more inclusive and, and my practice but also in the initiatives that I run as well um, but I think that's the thing like we are always so quick to slap down in our industry um, when something's not quite perfect or something's not quite right or it hasn't been said in exactly the right way. We're, we're going to get things wrong. We're only human beings. If people have questions, are you happy for people to come back to you to chat about things? Or, you know, if they've got speakers, uh, speaker opportunities, like you said, you know, would you be happy for people to approach you? Oh, blimey. Yes, absolutely. Um, you, you've heard how willing, uh, but just back to Driven. No, I wasn't aware of it. And now uh, when I wake up from my nap, my power nap, <laughs> I, I may well look it up. But um, one, I'm a I'm a Rax fanboy. What a lovely chap. Um, oh, uh, Rax, he's the best, isn't he? <laughs> Rax, Rax, if you're listening, you're fab. Um, but um, <laughs> I, just um, I, I think to, to that very point you were making, have the imperfect conversation as opposed to no conversation that that's the important thing and language changes and and uh the importance of various issues change change so you know in the 70s when i was at school even though i'm 23 as i stress um uh, you know i remember i can't remember if i said it but i bet i did calling people spaz it was one of the um one of the things you called each other yeah. um uh, and of course in karma's greatest performance ever i now have spasms as one of my um one of my uh symptoms um and at the time well dickens and and whatever we were cripples were we not um and then it went on yeah. to be handicapped and that's still the word in in the US and in France, for example, they, they, they're still on the word handicap, whereas the word currently to say is disabled. Um, so language changes. It, it's very difficult to be perfect, but yeah. that shouldn't stop you having the blooming conversations in the first place. Fear of putting a foot wrong or, or a toenail wrong. Yeah. It, it, it's it's diving in and approaching the subject. And yeah. uh, thank you, um, the driven team, for all you tried. And I'm sorry for um, those who waded in thinking they knew better. The point I would probably try and make to people listening is that don't let people put you off from trying to make a difference. Yes, you have to have thick skin in our industry, especially if you're making like a, a, a bold move and something that might they might not be well received by everybody. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, if you think about all these great entrepreneurs out there, if you think about how things are changed, how things are adapted, it's because people test ideas. It's because it's because people try. We need to still march on and push on to try and develop and be a more um, inclusive industry, no matter anything, like any of your background or your experience, um, take that and, and use that to really enrich the value of organisations and the offering and the products and services and everything else, but also 
remember that everyone's a human being. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, you talked about, again, we, we're going back to having the conversation. You know, there, there are PR analogies for that anyway. You know, um, it, it's daring to fail, isn't it? The, the good old stunt in PR. You know, uh, there's a few mo- too many things have been flo- floated down the Thames. Oh, goodness. But, <laughs> but you know, stunts, you, they don't always work, but you, you try, you have a go at them. And um, in, in crisis PR, you know, there's a blooming formula. The health and safety of our X, insert X here is of the utmost importance. Now, I'm afraid that bores me to death. And I, I, I wish we could find a different example of that. But, you know, I, I think when you come up with something original, but still, you know, caring and empathetic, dealing with a crisis um, it is, again, you're, you, you're being a bit more daring. Another one is the announcement of a job. Is have you ever seen any job announcement that doesn't say wealth of experience? Yeah. Uh, bloody hell. So, uh-huh. um, so uh, there's another area where I just think we should push the boundaries. Yeah. And just the same in diversity, we should dare to fail. We should push. What an amazing way to end this podcast because it is a call to action to people. It actually is a call to action to people to you know, think of things differently, do things differently, um, go out there and make a point of it and don't be worried about failing because, you know, you can apologise and you can move on, but we are all human beings and that's, at the end of the day, what um, human beings do. Human beings do make mistakes. (laughs) No, absolutely. It's just that not all of us will be James Bond. Yeah, <laughs> you needed to get that right in there, didn't you? And I also must say, you've referred to yourself as age of 23, 29. <laughs> I'm going to go Google you and see you're actually, no, I won't bother. Um, uh, but thank you so much for your time. It's been fabulous to talk to you, to hear about your experience. Um, you've got some great anecdotes to, to put in there as well. And to talk about some of the experience you've had in your earlier years as well is amazing to um, to hear about you know what you were like as a lad <laughs> a couple of years ago <laughs> ah, yeah. um, thanks so much Mark I'll get you back on the podcast again soon because it'd be great to follow up and see um, you know what, how you're doing um, how the industry's doing and, and what else has happened um, especially because you know things are ramping up for you just now with all your TV appearances <laughs> oh my word I, I'm so tired get get <laughs> Get me off the t- now. Get me on the telly again. Thank you very much, Laura. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks to you for tuning in to another episode of People by People. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please head over to leave me a review just now. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you can get these directly into your streaming app. Any suggestions for future guests, please do let me know. What tends to work better is if I know the person, because then we can have a proper conversation. Till next time, see you soon.